Hi, my name is Ricky Levine. I'm the director of the Holland Museum and I use the pronouns she and her. Thank you for joining us for what is certainly a timely conversation about a history that impacts many communities all over the country, including our very own. Tonight's program is part of the Holland Museum's Cultural Lens Series, the series sponsored by Spectrum Health Zealand Hospital and Warner Norcross and Dread with additional support from the Holland Zealand Community Foundation and Herman Miller Cares. We're also grateful to have the continued support from the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. Just a couple of bit of housekeeping items. This is being recorded. We ask everyone to remain on mute. We actually have a sold out program. We have lots of people still coming in. Um, so it will be really respectful if you keep yourselves on mute so that others can hear the entire program. If a question comes to mind and you don't wanna wait until the end where there is a Q&A, please feel free to put that in the chat. We'll make sure that our presenters see your question um, when we come to that Q&A period. And we do send out surveys after these programs. We ask that you complete it and send it back to us. It will only take a few minutes of your time, but it will let us know that what we're doing is, is resonating with you or not. And we want to know it either way. And then also we invite you to share ideas for future programs at any time. That really helps us uh, continue to do the programs that the community is looking for. The new exhibit opening next week at the museum is Matthias Alton Beyond the Oil Paintings. And this exhibit celebrates the 150th anniversary of the birth of Matthias Alton this year. He's one of West Michigan's most recognized artists. And we will display some of Alton's unique pieces of watercolors and sketches that are on loan from the Grand Valley State University Art Gallery collection. The museum will be the only venue hosting these images this year, they're rarely seen together in exhibit. And we'll also feature a timeline of Alton's life from his immigration from Germany to throughout his life in the United States. And we hope you come to the museum very soon. We have another program coming up on the 18th of this month, month which continues the conversation about fair housing, but this is a children or a family program. We will be reading the book, The Fair Housing Five and the Haunted House. The book will be read in English and Spanish, which is really exciting for us. It's our first bilingual program. And it is suitable, as I said, for the entire family. The Fair Housing Center of West Michigan will mail a complimentary co copy of the book, both available in Spanish or English, and a coloring activity to those who register within the time frame. So please go to our website for registration for this event and to stay current on all our programs and exhibitions. You may also follow us on social media, sign up for our weekly newsletter to find out what's going on in a timely fashion. The museum's current hours are Monday, Friday, and Saturday from 10 to five. In addition to the exhibits, we have unique items in our gift shop. And remember memberships make great gifts all year long. We're always open the second Monday of the month in the evening from 4 to 7 p.m. for free. And next second Monday is March 8th, 8th which happens to be next Monday. So uh, you can always join us in those evenings. And we continue to offer these programs at no cost. We continue to keep Mondays, the second Mondays open at no cost because we are trying to be as accessible as we can to the entire community. But if you enjoy these and you have the capacity, we ask if you would please consider a donation to the museum so we may continue them. You may do so online, through our website, you could call the museum or come to the museum directly to make those donations. So we appreciate your consideration for that. So on to tonight. This conversation is being offered in partnership with the Fair Housing Center of West Michigan. And it is my privilege to introduce our presenters for this evening. We are delighted to have Dr. Fred Johnson returning to present another topical program with us. He spent the first half of his childhood in the Philippines where his father, an Air Force veteran, was stationed. 
And early in his career, Dr. Johnson served in the Marine Corps. He worked in the automotive, telecommunications, and aerospace industries. He earned his master's and doctorate degrees at Kent State University, graduated with his master's of divinity degree from Western Theological Seminary right here in Holland. While at Hope, Dr. Johnson has earned numerous awards, including the Hope College Favorite Professor Award and the HOPE, Hope Outstanding Professor Educator Award. In 2008 and 2010, he ran for the United States House of Representatives as the Democratic nominee for Michigan's 2nd Congressional District. Along with numerous book reviews and presentations, Dr. Johnson has authored three novels. He is co-author of Tupac Shakur, The Life and Times of an American Icon. And he's completing the first draft of Schmuck, My Journey from Betrayed Democrat to Theorist Independent which recounts the lessons he learned on the campaign trail. Most recently, Dr. Johnson presented two programs on the election process and democracy for the Holland Museum. And these programs can be found on our website under past programs with most of the other programs we've done since we've gone virtual. For the past 15 years, Liz Keegan has been the Director of Education and Outreach at the Fair Housing Center of West Michigan, providing fair housing training to the housing industry, and the community at large. Prior to joining the staff full time, she worked for the organization as an independent contractor, coordinating the center's annual fair housing luncheon and workshop series. In addition to the series, Keegan is responsible for coordinating their annual Lakeshore Breakfast, the Friends of Fair Housing event, and the Fair Housing Book Clubs. Keegan has served on the executive committee of the Ottawa Area Housing Coalition, now Lakeshore Housing Alliance, since 2009. Before she joined the Fair Housing Center of West Michigan, Liz worked for the Community Leadership Institute at Aquinas College, conducting research, facilitating forums, and educational events, as well as community organizing. Keegan received her bachelor's degree from Aquinas in 1998. Liz was the driving force for getting tonight's program to fruition and the museum and I personally am grateful for this new and important partnership. We are delighted to have these two knowledgeable presenters on tonight's topic and I will now turn over the screen to Dr. Johnson. Thank you so much Ricky for that wonderful invitation. I'll do the screen share now and we'll get started. We're talking about fair housing and giving some historical context to how we ended up with the fair housing situation or for many people, the unfair housing situation that they're dealing with today. So let's start here. Generally speaking, so many of the ills and ailments socially that we're dealing with in 2020 and 2021 have to do with the fact that justice very often has been slain by the law. No different than what we're talking about with regard to fair housing. Fair housing and the attitudes, the mindset, the belief systems, the, the, the chicanery, all the things that people have done to make sure that those that they think are worthy of fair housing or good housing and those who people think are not worthy of it all came about as a result of a mindset that without going into the full historical explanation of it, after the Civil War, it produced something called Jim Crow segregation, which was in many ways and is the foundation of injustice. Let's start here. In 1896, in Octoroon, that is a person who was one eighth black, Homer Plessy rode a train in Louisiana and he was kicked off the train. He was kicked off the car where he was. He was sit sitting in the whites only car. He got kicked off, was made into, right into the colored car. And he decided to take the case to court. The court case made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1896, in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court of the United States handed down a decision that said, as long as the accommodations were separate, they could be legally equal. As long as the accommodations were equal, they could be legally separated. Hence the doctrine of separate but equal. Now, the reality is, is that they were always separate, never equal. But by embossing this, by entrenching this in the law, 
a cultural reality now was backed up by legal sanction and it spread across the country. So often we talked about the South being the primary uh, area where so, so much of this took place. And the South was egregious in what it did when it came to segregation. But let us not kid ourselves and let us not be naive. Segregation took place also in the North, just in a different kind of way. As indicated, bear with me as I read here. In the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, the 1896 Supreme Court held, upheld the lower court's decision in the case of Homer Plessy, a black man flew from Louisiana, challenged the constitutionality of segregated railroad coaches, first in the state courts and then in the US Supreme Court. The high court upheld the lower courts noting that since the separate cars provided equal services, the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment was not violated. It is worth mentioning that the 14th amendment was that amendment that was passed not very long after the civil war. The same civil war that was fought to end slavery. The same civil war that saw the 13th that amendment that abolished slavery, the 14th amendment that gave us due process, dual citizenship, equal protection of the law, all these things that modernized the constitution, the 1787 constitution that basically guaranteed slavery in it. So in just a few short years after the 14th amendment's passage, this constitutional amendment was basically gutted by the Supreme Court and set up a condition that would follow us into the 20th century and overshadow us in the 21st. So much of Jim Crow segregation was made to become a reality and made to last because of domestic terrorists. Now, we are not at all in our time unfamiliar with domestic terrorism, the most recent, the most recent act of it being on January 6, 2021. But in the period that we're talking about, in 1866 in Memphis, Tennessee, or rather in Pulaski, Tennessee, in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1866, an organization was founded called the Ku Klux Klan. And their goal was simple. Their goal was to return the reality of the South back to the status quo ante. That is, to return the South back to the, things way, the way things were before the Civil War. That is, to make sure that Black people inhabited a part of society definitely on the margin and would know to, take, to stay in their place. In 1915, the Ku Klux Klan was glamorized in a movie called Birth of a Nation. We don't have time to go into the, the, the immeasurable damage done by this movie. Let's just say that D.W. Griffith, the filmmaker, like any other person who's about to market something, knew the, the audience that he was speaking to. And he knew that his audience in 1915, that is America, would be prepared. And so many people would be ready to hear a story that told the story of reconstruction that 12 years after the Civil War from 1865 to 1877 as a time when Black soldiers were running in muck, stuffing ballot boxes, chasing after white women, lusting after them, being corrupt, being abusive, just misbehaving, and making society just miserable. And along comes the Ku Klux Klan to restore order. The cataclysmic result of D.W. Griffith's movie not only took an organization that quite frankly had been shrinking in number and made it popular, but by the 1920s, and I have just two examples here. By the 1920s, as you can see here on August 22nd, 1925, there were Ku Klux Klan marches being staged in Washington, DC. Let's be very clear about this. In the background, you see the nation's capital, the Congress, the US Congress, the same building that was stormed by white supremacist mobs on January 6, 2021. Inside that house are legislators, people that pass laws, and inside that house, those legislators in 1925 were clearly aware of the fact that there were domestic terrorists outside marching down Pennsylvania Avenue. Folk, when the people that passed the laws have no problem with domestic terrorists staging marches outside and consider that to be a normal good thing, all it does is it reassures the domestic terrorists that they're on the right side of the law that the law is behind them and that whatever they do, they know they can do it with impunity. That means also impacting housing. Here we have another scene of the Ku Klux Klan marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in 1928. The short note on this is that January 6, 2021 was not the first time that these kind of mobs had descended upon the nation's capital. What were they enforcing? They were enforcing that same Jim Crow segregation that was passed into law 
sanctioned by law by the Supreme Court with, with Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. And as I mentioned, it was always separate, never equal. And for anybody who wanted to push against the system, who wanted to resist the system, who wanted to, who, to challenge the system, the Ku Klux Klan and other similar type of organizations were always there to enforce the unwritten law of subservience and subjugation. There was not one law, one area, one sector, one corner, one shadow, one alley, one anything in society that was not touched by segregation in the night after, after the Civil War and all the way up until 1954 with the cases of Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court case that struck down segregation in public schools and eventually like dominoes, if you cannot have segregation in public schools, then the question arose, can you have segregation in other public areas? But nevertheless, we should not also be naive about this. Just because the Supreme Court said that a certain thing was illegal, didn't mean that it was gone the following day. The people who were intent upon having this system, they extended it so far as to include water fountains as you saw, bathrooms, and the system was rigid. And quite frankly, anybody who pushed against it, anybody who challenged it, anybody who sought to overturn it, ran the risk of losing their lives. I've seen statistics that say that between 1880 and 1968, approximately 144 black men a year or black people a year were lynched by mobs in the United States that did the lynching with the complete understanding that no one would come and arrest them and that they stood a better chance than, than normal of getting away with murder quite literally. Here's a question for you. If you can take a person's life with impunity, that is literally murder someone and get away with it. If you can do like the people did in Marion, Indiana in 1931 and lynch two people like A. Smith and Tommy Ship and stand there for a group photo like they did that night with two dead bodies hanging from the tree and they're looking to the eye of the camera and they're smiling and waving like they're taking a, a picture at a family reunion. If you can do that and know you're not gonna get any kind of trouble for it, you're not even gonna get questioned about it, no one's going to investigate. In other words, that the entire society knows what goes on and is okay with that. If you can take a person's life with impunity like that and actually be rewarded for it, what else can you not take from them? If you can take a person's life, I mean, after all, what's left? And the answer is you can take everything and leave nothing. When you can take a person's life, you can take everything they've got. You can impact every other area with impunity, with equal impunity. And that also means unfair housing. When it comes to airfare highness, unfair housing, the term that sometimes is used most often associated with unfair housing is redlining. Now, according to legal, uslegal.com, it's the practice of discrimination based on the racial makeup or character of a person's neighborhood, most often used in the context of extending credit or providing insurance coverage. Let's be very clear here. It's more than just where you live. It's being able to, to purchase the home in the first place. That's finance, that means banks. It's the ability to buy insurance for the home, which you really, in some cases, can't even get a home if you don't have it. And you can't keep it if you don't have it. So you have the financial services industry that's married up with the real estate industry, in addition to mortgage banking, it's a, a very interconnected web that all produces this thing called redlining. Now, those who claim redlining by an insurance company have commonly been denied homeowner's insurance or canceled, not renewed by an insurance company because of the racial composition of the area in which their home was located. Or those who claim redlining by an insurance company have commonly been charged higher premiums for homeowners insurance because of the racial composition of the area in which their home is located. The irony here is that generally speaking, the homes inside of an area that's been redlined have also been devalued by the people doing the appraisals. But on the other hand, the homeowners insurance for those same homes that are devalued have a higher insurance rate placed upon them, further making life difficult for the people who probably cannot pay those higher rates to begin with. 
And those who claim redlining by an insurance company have commonly been not offered the best homeowners insurance coverage by an insurance company, usually replacement value coverage because of the age, value, or other characteristics of their home. If you remember anything about the recent Great Recession of 2007, 8, or roughly from 2006 to 2010, remember the thing about the, the subprime mortgages that people were buying, the less than secure or the less than prime uh, financial products that people were being sold as they bought, bought their home, and usually this were, these were the people of color. That is a manifestation of the same process going on here, of that mindset, of that poison in the system. Now, it's just a redlining. So if we go back to in, in the beginning, where the redlining began, we had to ask when, how, and why did this start? An inflection point, a point of departure, a watershed moment, Black Tuesday, October 24th, 1929, the day that the stock market crashed. Listen, what we went through a few years ago with the Great, Re with the Great Recession was scary. It kept people up at night, and it should have, because millions of people lost their jobs, lost their homes, lost their life savings. And the question still remains is, is are the people that engineered the thing ever going to see any time behind bars? That's another discussion, though. But on October 24th, 1929, there was no doubt that the greatest economic disaster in United States history came upon the nation when the stock market crashed. It was the beginning of something called the Great Depression. Now, like the Great Recession, there was the thing that happened, and then there was a slow rolling effect. The stock market crashes on October 24th, 1929, but it took three years, three years before the, the depression, the full impact of the stock market crash brought the country to what some historians have referred to the trough or the lowest part of the depression, when things got about as bad as anybody could have imagined. And by that point, the nation was in economic free fall. By 1932, it was an election year. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democratic candidate, won the nomination, won the election. And one of the first things he did was start passing legislation for what they called Roosevelt's alphabet soup. Things like the WPA, Worst Progress Administration, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the NRA, the National Recovery Act, all these different things, these different acronyms that were designed to put people to work and to stop the economic bleeding of the United States. One of the things that Roosevelt's administration did was create something called the HOLC or the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Bear with me as I read. It's a New Deal agency created to find and refinance homes to prevent foreclosures. There was a foreclosure crisis in the Great Depression. Again, think about the Great Recession. Millions of people losing their homes, people walking away from their homes. For the real estate industry, for the insurance industry, for the banking industry, for the overall economy, when people can't pay their mortgages, especially by the tune of hundreds or thousands or millions, it is not good for the economy. So likewise, in the Great Depression, the president was seeking to find some way of stopping that bleeding. The HOLC surveyed real estate trends in the nation's largest cities, working with local lenders and realtors. They assessed, that is, they made judgments about neighborhoods using a number of factors ranging from terrain to income levels to the infiltration of a lower grade population by which they meant African-Americans, Jews, immigrants, and poor whites. You have to ask yourself sometimes, just exactly when is this going to change? This is 1933 we're talking about. And we should also take note of the fact, and I don't want to just gloss over this, that this problem begins with the federal government. Using these assessments, they assigned a grade for each neighborhood's residential security. Green A neighborhoods were the hotspots where mortgages were deemed to be reasonably safe. On the other end of the spectrum were red or D areas that were characterized by detrimental influences in a, in a pronounced degree. And mortgages in those areas were considered much more risky. One more time, a program begun by the federal government to just try and figure out which neighborhoods are good, which neighborhoods are not so good, which neighborhoods have values or whatnot. Well, in other words, trying to develop a plan by assigning these letter grades, A, B, C, or D, to figure out who needs the most help, where, when. The HOLC produced maps for each city showing the grades for all areas. The HOLC produced maps for each city showing the grades for all areas. Here's what they, they began to look like. 
So in summary, the HOLC was created to save homeowners from eviction. The government bought mortgages from banks and then restructured them with lower interest rates and longer terms. About 10% of homeowners in the US had mortgages with the HOLC, but still thousands could not make even the adjusted payments. We're talking about a terrible time in the Great Depression. Now the Homeowners Loan Corporation records indicated during the years 1933 to 1936, 44% of its assistance went to native white persons. 42% went to native white and foreign and 1% went to the category they called Negro. The legend they used for scoring these neighborhoods, green got an A grade, exclusively white. Now this is by the federal government. This is the yardstick they were using. And those green areas were eligible for 80% of mortgage value to get some assistance. Mostly white areas, let's say those are immigrants. Second grade, little lighter green, they were eligible for 60 to 80% of mortgage value assistance. Mixed, mi mixed neighborhoods, they got a C grade. They were eligible for only a 50% help for the mortgage value. And then mostly black, D, completely ineligible for mortgage insurance. That is, black people who also need some place to live, we're not gonna get any help. So what this meant then, if they were facing eviction, if they were facing foreclosure, their only alternative was to be put out. No help available for you. These maps, as I mentioned earlier, this shows a map that was drawn for Austin, Texas. Here's a map showing the red lines in Charlotte, North Carolina. 1935. This is a map showing the red lines for Seattle, Washington. Just again, just in case we find ourselves being lulled into thinking that these kind of things happen only in the South. They did happen in the South quite a bit, egregiously, persistently, consistently, in a most monstrous sort of way, but they were not confined to the South. Seattle, Washington, in the North, in the Pacific Northwest, 1936, Wichita, Kansas. 1939, Los Angeles, California. Are you kidding me? Out there with all the sunshine, Hollywood movie stars in Los Angeles too? Absolutely, why? Because so many people in the Great Depression and as, a, as people after the Civil War migrated, they picked up and moved where? Further west. Los Angeles and California was not immune to the kind of racist proclivities and mindsets that the rest of the nation was dealing with also. And then the North side of Chicago in 1939, it's worth mentioning that 1939, while neighborhoods are being drawn in red and people are being segmented based on what they look like, what race they belong to, it's the same year, 1939, that Nazi Germany will launch its attack on Poland in September, 1939, starting World War II. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, one of the greatest amphibious operations in all of history took place. D-Day, Operation Overlord, the liberation of Europe, not France, not Denmark, not Norway, but Europe, an entire continent. Landing on those beaches, those five beachheads that morning, that day on D-Day, June 6, 1944, there were African-American soldiers in army uniforms, but consistent with the way American history had been run up to that point, they fought in segregated units. In the skies over unit, or in the skies over Europe, you had Tuskegee Airmen who had been escorting white bomber crews to their target and back, and then going to their separate airfields. Do you understand that the Nazis were perhaps, except for, with the possible exception of South Africa and the Southern United States, one of the most virulently bigoted, racist, poison societies ever in the history of humanity. And we went to fight them with a segregated military. The Tuskegee Airmen were never taught to fly anything other than fighter planes or twin engine B-25s because people in the States figured that they didn't want them to learn how to fly the four engine B-17 because they didn't want them to be qualified to fly commercial airliners after World War II. They wanted to make sure those jobs were reserved only for white pilots. At some point, all you can do is just shake your head. 
D-Day was significant in ending World War II. World War II will end in May 1945 in Europe. The European theater of operation. Of course, the war in the Pacific will go on until August. In September, the atomic bombs being dropped and surrender in early September 1945. One of the things that American soldiers, men and women coming back from overseas were offered was something called the GI Bill. Government issues, what GIs are called. And this was a government program that would provide these returning soldiers, these returning, these returning women and men, these soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guards, men and women, with the opportunity to buy a home, start a business, go to college. The belief was, listen, you have, you guys, you women have done a tremendous job and service for your country. You have helped us beat back one of the greatest threats to human life on the planet ever. And it was understood that given all the changes that had happened in the country because of the war, the fact that Ford, Chrysler, General Motors, it seemed like overnight had changed their production strategies and it retooled. Factories that once produced cars are now producing tanks and airplanes and ships. You know, it took a tremendous amount of innovation and engineering talent and tool and die making and all these things. In other words, it was the beginning of a technological revolution. And at some point during the war, people figured that these men and women coming back to the United States from these European and Pacific theaters would need an education to give them the ability to compete in what was emerging new technology economy. Those who wouldn't get that education would probably be left out of it. So the GI Bill was offered and for people to buy a home or for people to buy a farm. You see here in this advertisement, veterans, if buying a farm, home or business, learn about guaranteed loans. Consult your near, nearest office of the Veterans Administration. Well, that's what was supposed to happen. And it did happen for many people. However, for African-American soldiers returning from Europe, the same Europe that they had stormed those beaches on June 6, 1944, for African-American soldiers coming from the Pacific Theater, where they too had been part of the island hopping campaign, coordinated by General Dwight, I mean, General Douglas MacArthur and Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, when they came back to the United States, many things were different, but many things were still the same. The country was different because World War II left no choice but for things to be different. But when African-American soldiers came back, they were still black and attitudes toward them had not changed, despite their service. And the GI Bill that was supposed to be offered to these guys and these women, basically there was a, consist a consistent block of Southern senators, Democratic senators, at the time they called themselves Dixiecrats from old Dixie the South, who every time African-American soldiers tried to, for the most part, access or get, or get help from the GI Bill, they passed legislation or perform legislative tricks and mischief to make sure that for the most part, black soldiers, black veterans did not get the advantage of taking care of uh, taking advantage of the GI Bill. So this entire generation of service people who had done their duty were cut out of the ability to buy a home. Still, for most middle-class people, the way that you began building family generational wealth, they were cut out of educational opportunities that would allow them to get into the stream of being prepared for the new emerging economy. They'll have no opportunity. They'll get no skills. They'll have no home. They go back to being who they were. It was Jim Crow again. History.com puts it like this. Though the GI Bill helped white Americans prosper and accumulate wealth in the post-war years, it didn't deliver on that promise for veterans of color. In fact, the wide disparity in the bill's implementation ended up helping, helping drive growing gaps in wealth, education, and civil rights between white and black Americans. While the GI Bill's language did not specifically exclude African-American veterans from its benefits, it was structured in a way that ultimately shut doors for the 1.2 million black veterans who had bravely served their country during World War II in segregated ranks. So what about the 21st century? It might be best summed up as lots of movement, little change. For example, on April 30th, 2015, The Atlantic ran this particular article, which said that redlining has become the catch-all term to describe the homeowners, loan corporations attempt to assess mortgage lending risk 
in hundreds of African American cities. Redlining left black families out of the mortgage market and left them vulnerable to predatory lenders. Most of all, it propagated a cycle of inequality, which many poor black Baltimore residents still find themselves in today. From the Washington Post, May 28, 2015. Redlining just sounds like an old timey term, a practice that exists only in history and our retelling of it. The word has particular roots in the 1930s when the government sponsored HOLC. First, Started mapping American communities to sort through which ones were worthy of mortgage lending. Neighborhoods were ranked and color coded, and the D rated ones, shunned for their inharmonious racial groups, were typically outlined in red. This government practice was swiftly adopted by private banks, too, during an era of massive home ownership expansion in the US. And Black people and people of color, poor whites, immigrants were left out of that expansion. And the visual language of the mass became a verb. To redline a community was to cut it or from essential capital to be redlined was something even worse. And finally, the federal government eventually retreated from the practice and it was outlined by the Fair Housing Act in 1968. But black communities have warned that it still exists in subtler and changed forms in bank tactics that have targeted these same neighborhoods for predatory lending or in new patterns like retail redlining. Some of the persistent redlining though still looks an awful lot like the original. It is a reality that historic great linings makes homeownership beyond reach for many families and these communities today, regardless of how big banks behave now. And if you've been following the news over the last decade or so, over the last 20, 30 years, the big banks have frequently behaved poorly, egregiously, disastrously. And this has been part of it. Walter Savage Landor said, a delay in justice is injustice. I have sought to provide an historical backdrop to give some context to how and why the unfair discriminatory housing practices that continue to take place as I speak to you at this moment on March 4th, 2021. They have deep historical origins, just like so many other things that pertain to race or immigration or status or, poor, or poverty or anything else in this country, in our history. I trust it has been good enough. I will now turn the presentation over to my colleague, Liz Keegan, who will bring us up to date on what's been happening in a more contemporaneous sense. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. That is such an incredibly helpful framework to continue the conversation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hopefully that's viewable for everyone. So I really do wanna thank the Holland Museum for bringing Fred and I together tonight to kind of have us have the luxury of exploring this topic in a little more depth. So please do think about what questions or comments you wanna make. I'm gonna move fairly quickly to, to leave time for discussion. We've already had some really rich discussion about this and um, I look forward to hearing from all of you. And again, thanks so much to Dr. Johnson for giving us a framework. I'm gonna move us a little bit um, back and forward through time because of the richness of the foundation that he provided in order to kind of interpret what is happening with some of that uh, movement that we have made. I don't want to assume that everyone understands what fair housing means in, in the view of how my agency, the Fair Housing Center of West Michigan, looks at it. It's tied to law. It's tied to uh, a lot of effort and a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears to get us to the point where there are laws in place as a result of the history that Dr. Johnson shared that tries to protect people's ability to choose housing that meets their needs based on objective criteria free from discrimination, across a list of protected classes predominant to tonight's conversation, race, skin color, national origin, uh, religion are protected and we've added to that list over the years. Uh, but fair housing as a movement is tied to those existing protections at multiple levels of law. 
as we've looked at already, we've had a lot of policy, we've had a lot of enforcement of policy that has contributed to segregation of populations in housing by race. And where we live is where we spend all of our time. I think more so than ever, all of us are learning the lesson of, of where we live impacting our day-to-day -day lives. If we have the ability to spend more time at home, uh, the, the luxury of spending more time at home or working from home, we're, we're learning more a lot about um, our neighborhoods and what happens when we're out and about. Um, so we've got a lot of policy, a lot of history kind of shaping the practices that really became embedded. And I, again, can't say enough about that historical overview um, that we've been given to kind of dive deeper here. Uh, another tool that I wanted to highlight from the 30s um, that may seem, uh, again, as a, a history subject, I'll, I'll bounce us forward here in a moment, uh, but another tool you may have heard of before is a restrictive covenant that literally was um, part of a deed and made sure that any future residents um, were restricted in terms of their race. And here I've, I've uh, recreated the text because this um, historical snapshot of this document also from the Seattle, Washington area, which was a community that was mapped by the HOLC. Uh, this sample deed says no property shall at any time be sold, conveyed, rented, or leased to any person or persons not of the white or Caucasian race. Further, only white or Caucasian race um, shall be permitted to occupy any property with the exception of a domestic servant, as long as they're actually employed by a white person. So not only controlling who can hold the property, but also who has access to the property by race. Uh, these became a widespread tool in the 30s and 40s. Here's an example from DC that got very specific, again, using the language of the time, um, limiting or prohibiting occupancy of any person, um, anybody's ability to acquire this home or these lands, um, prohibiting the Semitic race, blood, or origin. They went further to include what they called racial descriptions of Armenians, Jews, Hebrews, Persians, or Syrians. So very specific subsets of populations being denied housing opportunity through these restrictive covenants. These are still existing in a lot of individual deeds across the country today. They can be very expensive to um, have struck from uh, the property. And a lot of people simply don't take the time or the expense to pursue that. So they do exist in a lot of places. So when you have that kind of carving out or setting aside of land or housing opportunity, um, what does that mean to us now today? Well, I, I was really pleased to come across this information out of Muncie, Indiana, that kind of illustrates what is this historical behavior now playing out in terms of um, access to those properties today. So here we've got 2010 census data um, layered with percentage of non-white residents. So you can kind of see the different shades of gray um, indicate a presence of non-white residents. And the red lines, I think it was potentially um, a conscious choice to use a red lining um, tool here in this map, uh, indicates the places that had the presence of racially restrictive covenants. And you can see by and large, the majority of the red shapes maintain a high white presence um, in the 2010 census data. So those, you know, something that we may think, well, that's been outlawed, you know, restrictive covenants were actually outlawed in the late forties, um, but certainly the long-term implications of them are pretty visible here with this map. Further, um, I've had multiple occasions in my time at the Fair Housing Center to be um, approached with questions. Um, there are actually situations where we've had real estate agents representing housing opportunities attempt to um, use the presence of a racially restrictive deed today in today's housing market and as a means to kind of suss out the potential race of interested buyers we had a real estate agent ask another agent, what is the race of your buyers? This of course is a prohibited question and it shouldn't be a factor in the transaction at all. The agent that was listing the property went on to say, this is an exclusive community. People here are funny about other people. And finally said, point blank, the title work has covenant restrictions. So she's using this um, historical document, this historical tool to try to um, um, limit the access to this lakeside community in Northern Kent County for this particular home for sale in order to try to keep that community white. So um, we don't know if that was the presence of the sellers, her personal preference, but she brought that to the table as a housing professional um, and it demonstrates the importance of these laws. 
So um, Dr. Johnson gave us a great overview of the HOLC, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I just thought it was important to look at the actual assessment guide. This is the language. These folks that were sent out to assess over 230 communities across the country in the 1930s, uh, the cities had to be, I believe, uh, 100,000 or bigger at that point in time to qualify for the mapping project. So not every city has an HOLC map, but the larger ones across the country do, and we'll look at that in a moment. But you can see here the language, one of the factors that they were specifically instructed to assess was determine who's living there. Are they incompatible or, um, or not as racial and social groups? They're also asked to actually forecast out what the um, social and racial classes might be for that space. Um, so they're actually forecasting out on assumptions, I would imagine, not a lot of information or data. And it specifically says here that a change in social rate or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values, which sort of became a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is a great map of the 230 plus um, communities across the country that were mapped by the HOLC. You can actually see based on the color and different style of the dots, the percentage of the community and how it scored. So if you see uh, Sioux City in the center, Wichita, Kansas City, they're heavily red dots. So that meant that the majority of the area, the residential area that was mapped in those communities was actually given a D or a failing grade. So it's kind of interesting to see there's not very many that have a lot of the green or the blue, the passing A's and B's, um, and there's just a rich history of information to kind of dive down into in each of these communities based on the different profile neighborhoods. Um, we do have uh, a number of states across, uh, sorry, a number of cities across the state of Michigan that uh, were big enough to be included. So jumping a little bit forward from the 1930s into the 1960s, people were well aware of this disinvestment, this devaluing. Uh, by now it had been in place for several decades. Uh, Dr. King was actually working on what he called open housing at the time. He actually moved his family into a building in West Chicago that was fairly notorious for being a slum building to campaign for open housing, or we now call it fair housing. Um, it's pretty well known that there was a pretty violent welcome to the movement and to him specifically when he visited Chicago and actually they negotiated an agreement with the mayor to cancel a march, which is extreme. That is not something that um, happened in the civil rights movement with their commitment to nonviolence um, in, those, in those protests. They put up with a lot of abuse, experienced a lot of negativity to their presence. So it says something about the level of concern that would lead these folks who had been through so much already in the South to cancel a march in the North. Um, he was there for some time, uh, did some great organizing, eventually, and, and tragically as it would turn out, he returned to the South to further work for sanitation workers. He did leave Jesse Jackson working in Chicago on open housing. There's a phenomenal a set of color photographs of the time of the King family and Dr. King in Chicago, the Chicago Freedom Movement. Um, I, I encourage you to look into that and take a look at those beautiful photographs. Um, a person who became a Fair Housing Center executive director was actually there and took those photos um, and is now sharing them and they're in the Smithsonian African American Museum. So during that time in the 60s, we also kind of um, had so many people that were really trying to illustrate how housing discrimination occurred and prove that it's happening. And they became um, uh, really engaged in a process that we now call testing. So it's the practice of sending a white couple and a black couple into a real estate office to inquire about housing and simply observe how they're being treated. So that basis of what people see, you know, you can think of it as maybe secret shopping now, certainly has a rich history and an important history. Um, and it really was a, a really rock solid way to establish a pattern or practice of difference in treatment based on race. The couples were scripted to have matching income, matching background, same number of children, you know, very comparably qualified. The only difference between the two couples would have been their color of their skin. Um, so the only explanation for the difference in treatment would be tied to the color of their skin. This process of testing has been upheld uh, by the court systems for many, many years and testing is still done today. I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of our time here. 
1960, specifically in March, the, the president is very concerned about a lot of the civil unrest across the country. There's a lot of communities experiencing riots um, that happened, of course, across the state of Michigan as well. Um, there was a, a, a lot of work to evaluate what's leading to this unrest, what should we do about this, and the Kerner Commission published a report and it includes this infamous quote, our nation is moving towards two societies, one black and one white, separate and unequal. Again, that's March 1st, 1968. This famous quote has been cited in, in recent Supreme Court decisions as um, recently as 2015, upholding core principles of the Fair Housing Act, really calling into question, have we come much further from this moment in time in 1968? April 4th, 1968, we have the tragedy of the assassination of Dr. King. Uh, he was assassinated, as I said, when he went south to work on the sanitation strike. Um, this is Reverend Jackson reading about the assassination on April 4th. Seven days later, seven days later, after years and years and years of struggle and a lot of failed bills and a lot of legislation that went nowhere, uh, we have the passage of the Fair Housing Act on April 11th, 1968. This is uh, President Johnson signing the Fair Housing Act um, in direct response to Dr. King's assassination. So it unfortunately took the tragedy of his death and the loss of that voice and the leader of that movement to finally include housing in all of the civil rights efforts. Um, you know, we had had a lot of organizing around voting and other equal access, but housing is very personal and it was a bitterly fought battle and it took this, this tragedy to move it forward. Um, as I said, you know, there was unrest all over the country. Here we have Baltimore um, sample in 1968. This resonates very closely with a lot of us, of course, thinking back to the summer of 2022. I should say 2020 also. <laughs> So here is uh, the Grand Rapids, Michigan HOLC map. As I mentioned, um, Holland was not big enough to have qualified to be mapped by the HOLC, but I want to share, you know, a, a community that some of you may be familiar with because I want to bring us forward and have it um, uh, an example of how this applies today. So this was actually a 1937 map. And um, considering all the buzz and full disclosure, I do live in Northeast Grand Rapids, um, considering all the buzz about Grand Rapids and West Michigan, 80% of Grand Rapids, more than 80% of Grand Rapids received a C or a D, you know, a failing grade in, in 1937. So they were not forecasting a robust, a robust history or good value um, in, these, in these neighborhoods. And, and um, a lot of the neighborhoods have proven them wrong. However, with this tool, we've got uh, the, the red lining. It's a little pinkish, but you can see the neighborhoods that scored poorest. Um, and then uh, the yellow is that C grade. Um, you can sort of see the river cutting through the middle. There's some uncolored areas because they were not residential. So I want you to kind of focus on your screen here and look at the yellow and red shapes as you can and just kind of identify which of those neighborhoods um, as a general outline were um, scored lower because we're gonna move forward and look at the same space and layout in 2010 based on the race of the occupants of the neighborhood. This is called a racial dot map. Each dot represents the race of a person. The blue dots are white residents, the bright green are black residents, the red dots, which are a little harder to um, differentiate, are Asian residents. Then we have orange as Hispanic residents, and then um, other race, Native American multiracial, again, using census data and those categories they use. I'm gonna flip back and forth here so again, you can kind of see those shapes of which neighborhoods were devalued or forecasted as risky and lost out on investment infrastructure, of course, home ownership and leveraging opportunities with mortgages not available. And look at the, the segregation and the population that lives in those communities that didn't get the same amount of support um, and investment. It also can really highlight the levels of segregation that we continue to have in Grand Rapids. Um, this is a, a, a best image as I could get as um, possible for Holland in terms of, again, the same breakdown for racial dot map, one dot per person. There is uh, a set of links that we will share with you towards the end of our time together, and this link will be included. This is a map of the entire country, and you can zoom in and out of different spaces where you may have visited or lived 
um, and spend a little bit of time kind of looking at what this uh, what these communities looked like in terms of racial segregation in fairly current terms, especially given the history uh, and the point where we started today. So something else that I think is really uh, fascinating is we're better understanding what these historical behaviors and patterns have created in our neighborhoods today. And um, I'm gonna walk through a series of, of images out of Richmond, Virginia. Um, and again, you'll get the, the link to this story out of the New York Times. These were red line neighborhoods. So failing neighborhoods or risky investment neighborhoods um, from the 1930s in Richmond. And what the, the paper took the opportunity to do was look at what is that impact today. So in terms of um, one of the factors they wanted to look at was what's the weather like? What's the heat? <laughs> so this I think is really interesting because you can see, again, we've got the red shapes and the darker red and the, you know, the darker orange areas show those are the hotter neighborhoods. Um, it may be pleasant to think about on a chilly March day, but you know, we've been in spaces, public spaces where we have felt that heat and we tend to see an unfortunate um, correlation between um, losing older members of our community, younger um, children suffer more in the heat and who lives where. So we're better understanding that these disinvested neighborhoods are now suffering from higher heat um, based on kind of correlating the two sets of data. We can also look at, you know, which of the neighborhoods are cooler. Um, and you can certainly see the neighborhoods that were not redlined tend to be much cooler today. So that's in terms of actual temperature. And they say that they did look at this across the country. So this is, um, you know, um, something that we can understand applies here as well. Something they also looked at was tree coverage. Um, something that I loved about the neighborhood that I moved into um, are the type of trees that they chose to line the streets. And um, it's you know, something that I just always enjoy no matter what time of year it is. Um, so tree coverage of course can contribute or um, be a factor in the, the air quality, the temperature of the neighborhood. Um, and we can see that less trees, um, the districts with less trees also tend to have a relationship with the red line neighborhoods. And one other factor they looked at was just the volume of paved surfaces which of course can trap and then radiate heat. Um, and again, we can sort of see uh, the red line neighborhoods do have some correlation with some of the heaviest um, concentrations of paved surfaces as well. So it's really important to kind of um, share these stories and make those, those um, connections across history of, you know, well, what does it mean that we disinvested these communities? What does it mean that this became kind of common practice for people to not invest in these neighborhoods? What does it mean to us now? And we can see that there's uh, health and quality of life implications. So as I mentioned, you'll get these um, links. So uh, another way to really look at this is where you live impacts potentially now how long you live. So um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has a tool that you'll get uh, where you can plug in different addresses and look at how long am I projected to live based on my address. Um, this is my current home, for example, I'm looking at 84 plus years. Uh, my county is uh, close to 80 years. Um, however, when I put in the area where I grew up, I lost a lot of years and the county overall um, was closer to 75 in terms of life expectancy. Um, in, in my neighborhood in particular, on the east side of Detroit, I was only given 73 years to live. So making that local to Holland, not every address will show up, I do wanna caution you, um, but you can choose close, um, close by uh, neighborhoods or um, addresses to plug in. So I kind of looked at south from the historic district. Um, we had an age um, projection of 79.4 near 17th, dropped a little bit near east 35th. Uh, we looked at Holland High School, bumped back up a little bit, looked over at Holland Township, uh, and it went all the way up to 80. But overall, fairly consistent, not quite uh, a dramatic drop. But I think, again, just kind of illustrating the fact that where we spend our time does directly impact our health and our lives. So when you're not allowed access to certain neighborhoods or certain communities based over um, qualities about yourself that you cannot control, this um, escalates that unfairness or that, um, you know, it brings that damage into play. We have not moved away from maps very much. Um, these are some examples of maps that real estate agents have actually drawn out. These are not Michigan-based communities, 
um, where they have steered people or warned people off of certain neighborhoods tending towards um, race of the neighborhood. Um, therefore, um, pulling people away from neighborhoods that could use further investment or just removing choice from the table for that uh, potential buyer as a potential neighbor uh, completely. So uh, just in general across the country right now, we're seeing a lot of disability-based discrimination. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that tonight, but that's something that we are seeing um, in West Michigan as well. We see race-based discrimination, discrimination based on our gender or sex, uh, whether we have children and our national origin um, tend to be very um, high areas for cases reported. There's all kinds of protections that exist at different levels. Holland has recently expanded their fair housing ordinance within the city limits to include education, where your money comes from, what type of income you have, your sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity are covered, height and weight are covered. Uh, but also where you live can increase or decrease your fair housing rights or protections that apply to you. If you live two miles outside of the Holland city limits, that ordinance doesn't apply to you and you wouldn't have these same rights as you would in the city. So these protections exist and leave gaps um, at multiple levels. Michigan has additional protections here. And then, you know, we've got a set limit of about seven that are protected everywhere across the country. So as I mentioned in West Michigan, we do see disability based on uh, disability based discrimination, 96 cases last year. That's a high portion of our caseload, uh, about 30 cases for race or skin color. And again, discrimination against families with children. Heavily our, our cases were based on rental transactions, difference in treatment and rental transactions. This red slice of the pie here is a failure to accommodate people with disabilities. We do see sales discrimination, mortgage discrimination still occurring. Um, sometimes communities are built in a way that's inaccessible. We see advertising that's illegal. So it's, it's a lot of transactions that are covered and we see cases in a lot of different areas. Specific to Holland though, I wanted to kind of drill down. We've been active in the Holland area since um, about, um, oh, 2006, I would say, partnering with a phenomenal group of local advocates who've been doing fair housing for a long time on the ground. Um, but I was just able to pull numbers, case numbers from 2014 and kind of show you what the caseload looked like within the city. And it echoed what we were seeing, you know, nationally and across our entire service area um, with disability, families with children and complaints filed by um, race and or skin color. And then just a couple with uh, gender-based discrimination or national origin, where someone is from. Uh, the types of discrimination, again, were failure to work with people with disabilities, um, different terms and conditions and rent, uh, failure to allow for things like ramps or other necessary modifications that was tied with discrimination in sales. We also saw issues with mortgage um, lenders and then even zoning ordinances or policies in what governments can do or the limits that they may put on what type of housing is allowed where that can be discriminatory and it's all covered by fair housing. So the, the original um, intent of we need to ensure you know, every person who qualifies has access to housing has really grown across a lot of um, different ways to ensure housing choice. Unfortunately, we've seen a lot of hate crimes. They tend to occur near homes. Um, you know, we saw an uptick in 2017. We're still seeing same uh, higher levels of home-based hate crimes. Typically that's a fair housing violation when the message is you're not welcome here. Um, some of you may recognize um, this was an incident that happened in Holland a number of years ago. A maintenance person who um, was African-American came back and found uh, this message written on the wall of a unit that he had been working on to prepare for a new tenant. A family in Park Township found this caricature and the N-word written on their driveway. They were also a family of color. So you, can, you can imagine that it's very unsettling for this to occur. Just this summer in Grand Rapids, um, a black man came home to his apartment to find that somebody had written no blacks allow written on the door. They also returned um, and wrote KKK and WLM on the door a second time. So that of course was very upsetting and it's hard to tell what the intent is, especially when somebody returns. Um, but given the history that we looked at from Dr. Johnson of the KKK, I wanted to include that example. 
Um, we see all kinds of attempts to really limit not only access to the housing, but also, you know, the privileges that people are entitled to within the housing. So here's an example out of Ohio when uh, a manager put up a white only pool sign after a father living there got custody of his biracial daughter. So that's something else that fair housing centers can tackle. So um, Michelle's going to pop these links into the chat if she hasn't done already. So I just wanted to make sure that those were um, a reminder for me to tell you that that's coming. And I really encourage you to take a few minutes to look at the tools, look at the maps. Um, and then there's a great video by um, Richard Rothstein called Segregated by Design. It's about 20 minutes, um, but it really kind of is an animated dive into the HOLC maps and redlining. So I want to share a few things of what you can do <laughs> because I know we're sharing a lot of um, heavy information and we're talking about what progress hasn't been made. Um, there have been um, you know, advances. Each expansion of protections that include more people allow more equal opportunity. But we encourage you to contact us, report discrimination. If you're not sure if it's discrimination, that's okay. Call us and we'll talk it through and help you determine what's happening and if it's something we can address. If you're looking for housing, talk to your real estate agents or lending professionals that you're engaging with about their experience with fair housing, their commitment to fair housing, their familiarity with fair housing. You can join plan planning and zoning commissions as citizen members um, and have that awareness of fair housing protections and, and reach out to us for assistance on, on some education there. Um, a lot of things that we see right now, especially with the lack of affordable housing across West Michigan is, uh, you know, any proposed development sometimes will be um, treated with a, a not very welcome mat. So we call that nimbyism. It's, we, we accept that housing, but just not in my backyard. I don't want to live next to those people or, you know, they have the right to live here, but they'd really do better on the other side of town. Those sorts of veiled comments um, are potentially violations of fair housing laws. We also have great tools. You can host a book club. We've got um, some tools and suggestions on our website where you can do that, or we can help you do that. You can become a tester for us. We actually still utilize volunteers, of course, not in person right now, but we can train you. Um, and then you can decide if you'd like to do it or not. It's not a huge time commitment, um, but we would love to, you know, share more about that um, hands-on opportunity, so to speak, to help us assess the housing market, to figure out is housing discrimination occurring, um, you know, across West Michigan. And we need to represent all of those protected classes in our pool of trained volunteers. So you can tell we need a lot of people to be aware of it. Um, and we really uh, don't, you know, assign you a fabulous, fantastical character to be. We, we just, you know, work off of who you are and what you're comfortable with and ask you to explore housing opportunities and let us know how you were treated. Um, so that is uh, something that um, if you're interested in getting involved, we encourage you to reach out to us to do. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. I'm watching the clock. Um, I, and I think Fred and I will be able to take some questions here. Yeah, so please put some any of your questions in the chat box and uh, we'll be sure to make sure they're seen. Um, and while people are thinking about their questions, I have one. Um, I'm wondering about white flight. So what, what precipitated white flight so that obviously it was because of people of color in many cases were moving into communities. How were they able to get into those communities if they if the discrimination was occurring. Right, and, and Fred, I really welcome your input on this too. I just wanna to talk about a tool called blockbusting under the fair housing lens, where people were actually looking to, to, to make money off of this, um, this fear or this unfamiliarity of, of living in a diverse neighborhood, right? So real estate agents and speculators would say, ah, well, you know, here's, um, here's one family, one black family was able to acquire a property and, and they would literally go up and down the streets of neighboring um, homes or blocks and say, did you know so-and-so moved in, your property values are going likely going to drop. And if you act now, right? So that kind of fear factor of forecasting, these properties are going to lose value. Now they lost value because of the blockbusting, not because of the one family moving in. Um, and, and there's so many stories, you know, this infamously in Levittown, Pennsylvania, I think you mentioned that briefly, Fred, um, it took insane courage, partnership, um, and people, uh, allies, uh, sometimes they were Jewish, um, 
sometimes they were white, what they called straw buyers. So somebody would buy the home with the intent of a black family living there, but the black family would not be seen until the ownership transfer had occurred. So they had to use subterfuge to have access to any quality housing. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different stories of, of people really extending themselves to try to make that happen. The first black family that moved into Levittown was, uh, were victims of a, a campaign of terror, you know, firebombing, um, threats, um, trash thrown on the lawn. You know, the kids were afraid to play outside. They couldn't enjoy the suburban experience that they risked their lives to pursue. And you know, just to piggyback on what Liz is talking about, the, the experience of Levittown, when she says that this family was terrorized, these weren't by Klansmen. These are people, you know, people that you might see as just being regular everyday citizens. So we need to also remember that during the, especially during the civil rights movement, up until and then through the civil rights movement, there was this group of groups of people called the white citizens councils. Now, they were, they were in Chicago, they were in the North, you know, they had the neighborhood covenants that, that Liz was talking about. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put into the the chat, Ricky. There's a a link for this article written by Ta Nehisi Coates about the case for reparations. And let me emphasize this: it's not so much about the case for reparations, but it's the wonderful research he did that applies to what Liz just talked about about how people manipulated laws and then real estate practices that either were designed to make sure black people bought homes at a very, very inflated price with some of the most risky terms or what she was talking about this blockbusting, all these things that were done to make sure that people either couldn't get into a home or they got into a home, they were guaranteed not, be, not to be able to keep the home, but either way, their home buying experience, the home living experience was compromised. And that brings to mind, um, I wanna say real estate agents who were attempting to help were fined or could lose their license. So even if you had a real estate agent who was willing to work with anyone, regardless of any of the protected, well, pre-protected classes, right, regardless of their skin color, they could lose their livelihood, they could be fined, um, they could be ostracized, you know, and the real estate business is all about relationships. And of course, that ties into lending and insurance. Um, so even those that were really trying to be activists on the ground, uh, they you know, had one hand tied behind their back as well. So there were a lot of... Um, factors that had to be navigated to successfully um, own a home. There's a fabulous book called Arc of Justice. It's the true story of Dr. Sweet. And I know you mentioned him the other day, Fred, um, in our conversation. It's a Detroit story. It's four miles from the house that I grew up in. They had to use a straw buyer as a Black family. He was a, the, a very well-known Black doctor um, in downtown Detroit, 1920s. Yeah. He was, he was a dentist. And they... This, this community, they surrounded Dr. Sweet's home. They barricaded themselves, th themselves inside their home and basically terrorized these people. And you know, Dr. Sweet, like I said, he was a dentist. He wasn't just some uneducated guy, but, but you know, not that that should make a difference, but just to emphasize the point, he wasn't some, you know, some person who you know, didn't meet the educational qualifications, didn't meet the class qualifications, didn't meet the financial qualifications. He checked all the boxes except for the one that had to do with his skin color. So, you know, this, this and, and very often when you look at, when you look at some of the, the, the mindsets behind this stuff, you know, if you recall, I very often, you know, will use ex examples of art or references, references to movies, not to make the fact, but if in fact art resembles life, then there's something to be said for that. And if you've ever seen that movie, The Help, the movie The Help that came out a few years ago, there's a scene in the movie where the, the white woman who has the black maid, she always makes the maids go and use the bathroom outside because she thinks they have different diseases that are somehow peculiar to black people that she doesn't want to deal with. We're not talking about somebody who's got like some communicable or, or, or something like bubonic or you know, some plague type of disease, just that black people have special diseases that she doesn't want in her bathroom. Now that's fictional. I want to emphasize that's fictional, it's for a movie, but however, the part that's true, the part that's factual is that people did think like that, which is why you have these practices going on, that you have black people are somehow separate from a branch of hum humanity. And this mindset that permeated the need for separate bathrooms, separate water fountains, separate this, separate neighborhoods, separate, separate schools, everything like that, 
it's all part of the same dots being connected together that produce these terrible situations. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's so much better understanding and great data to help us understand why does this history matter? How does it apply today? It's pretty well understood that when you lock a generation out of a home ownership investment opportunity, now we can, of course, look at the ripple effects of that lost equity for that family. You know, I, there's so many elements. Um, Fred and I really had to trim down our presentations. You probably can't tell based on how much we covered. Um, but there are so many implications to, um, you know, each individual that was left behind or not allowed to make that investment so that, you know, there's um, more, more of a burden for the following generations. And sometimes those generations inherit debt or are not um, uh, able to build wealth. And we see that now. We see land contracts. We see predatory lending. Right. Uh, you know, we see really targeted loan products that are not sustainable for buyers that are not savvy in the financial world uh, bubbling back up. You know, we, we were very concerned as a movement of making sure that those type of loan products don't come back online, but they're already creeping back in. And we're barely 10 years away from the bubble of housing right. and foreclosure, right? That that, that bubble burst <laughs> already. You know, the, the argument then, Liz, remember the argument was, well, you know, these, this, this guy making, you know, $40,000 a year, shouldn't have bought a $400,000 home. What made him think he could pay for that? Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But if the lender had been doing their due diligence, why would you make a loan to a guy for $40,000 a year for a $400,000 home? There's some shared responsibility there. Sure, the home buyer should have known better and made it, you know, exercise bad judgment. But clearly the lender wasn't exercising a good faith either. Right, because they sold that loan and made their money and moved on, right, on the secondary market. There's a, there's a story, I, I can't remember where it was, but you know, I remember doing some research one time and it talked about this, this stretch of uh, down around Cincinnati, Ohio, that after the Civil War, it was right on the Ohio side of the river, of the Ohio River, where these black, these black people had been enslaved for generations. And then immediately after the Civil War, they were kicked off the land. And over the next few, two or three generations, this prime land that they were slowly moved from is because people figured out that that river land was prime real estate and they were forced off that land. And if there's, a, there's a book also uh, by, uh, there's a, by a guy named Andrew Lease entitled Places of Their Own or Places of, the, yeah, I think Places of Their Own. I did, I did a review for that book about, it has been a number of years ago. He talks about how during the great migration when black people came from the North, I mean, rather from the South to the North, they generally speaking were always confined to the outskirts of the urban communities because in the 19 teens, 1920s, before the Great Depression, we've come kind of full circle now where people wanted to live downtown city centers. Right. Those are the prime, those are the prime areas. So black people were pushed to the outskirts of the city. And you know, these are Southerners. They brought with them their ways and their, their, their oftentimes their animals. So for going out there for these rural areas was actually pretty good for them. But once things began to build up and these families had been there and that became prime real estate for the suburban area, they then were forced back into the city and channelized into ghettos. And, and, and the difficulty, Liz, Liz can speak more to this than I can, but the difficulty is that since this doesn't happen overnight, it happens over the course of the arc of a decade or two, or sometimes a half century, you don't see the immediate effects. But once you go back and start re you know, interrogating what happened, it, it is so, it's so diabolical. How you, can, you can just connect the dots and see how it all turn, turned up. Yeah, and, and the, you know, the, the modern look, which you hinted at, and again, we were really trying to look, um, limit our content, you know, the, the redlining today is, is really like credit deserts, you know, where are the banks and credit unions located? Do we have access to financial education and financial institutions in some of the more segregated neighborhoods? Um, you know, there's a case coming out of the East Coast where you would have to take a 45 minute bus ride to even get to a bank out of a black neighborhood that a location of a bank that existed in the black neighborhood, but all of their loan product information was 45 minutes away. Mm -hmm. And that's now, right? So there, so, you know, you really have to be like looking for and or testing or aware of that gap where you have to 
cross that hurdle that most of us don't have to cross to get basic a pamphlet on loan information, right? right. Um, and we also assess who's a, a worthy uh, risk in ways that we don't need to. There's a, there's a lot of great information coming out of the National Fair Housing Alliance where they're looking at um, what is credit scoring? Who fares better in the credit scoring system? in terms of race scores, in terms of qualifying people for loans. We didn't have that for hundreds of years when we were exchanging property and money in this country, right? Mm -hmm. So there's another opportunity there to really get creative and figure out meaningful ways where no one ends up in a bad loan product. No one ends up underwater. We don't want that for anyone. That's, that's a devastating outcome where we literally then have stresses on our homeless, you know, our homeless resources or people are doubling up or now we're learning in a pandemic, we can't couch surf. We can't just crash with someone without this incredible health risk. You know, we're really, I think we'll come out of this pandemic. I'm always looking for silver linings. I think we'll all have a better awareness of the importance of place, that safety cushion and who has access to those types of resources. And thankfully we've got, I'm, you know, I'll brag on behalf of the Lakeshore Housing Alliance in, in the greater Holland area, Ottawa County, a phenomenal network of people that are working so hard to ensure that homelessness is, is short and non-reoccurring, uh, yeah. but it is challenging now in, in a pandemic. Well, you know, I, I sit on the board for the Habitat for Humanity, Kent County, mm -hmm. and that organization, we have continued to do, they have continued to do the work through the pandemic. I mean, look, it's been tough, yeah. but um, our executive director, Bev Teal, and her support team, they've been great, you know, and, and it's just one of many, many uh, approaches to this situation. You know, it, it's, it's almost, it, it almost tempts one to say that housing should be a, a human right. I mean, in a modern society, it's something everybody needs. You know, it's like food and water, shelter, right? It, it, it's in the, the, the hierarchy of things that you have to have if you're going to function even minimally in a society like the United States. You have so, to hunker down, hunker down now. Where is that? What does that mean? Um, I think more people will understand that. And again, I cannot thank the Holland Museum team enough for helping us highlight some of just, you know, the top of the iceberg of all of these issues. I hope we're connecting um, how interwoven it all is. And then to ask you to think about equity on top of it is a lot. Um, but we're also not even touching, you know, the rights of people with disabilities. As I said, that's a huge issue yep. across the country um, mm -hmm. in housing, in equity. Um, but with all the technology that we're utilizing and learning how to use, there's an opportunity to be more inclusive potentially for people who use technology more so than I do. <laughs> And there's something, there's something, Liz, that, I, I, that you, you said that triggered a, a thought based on what our conversation was the other day. And it is the fact that for, for all the great work you guys are doing, people need to also realize that there have been attempts over the last 10, 15, 20 years, I don't know, I can't say specifically how long, but it's been decades now where there's been, a, there has been an attempt to not abolish foul, fair housing agencies, but to underfund them, to underfund them so terribly to where they can't do the job that they were mandated to do, that they were created to do. So I think that the people who seek to do that, their, their logic is that to get rid of it altogether might result in a howl too strong even for them. So what they'll do is they just hobble you financially to make sure you can't get the work done. Big caseloads that never get resolved and to make sure that, you are, that you're utterly ineffective. And if you're ineffective long enough, the people lose hope, they stop coming to you and then they have a problem that exists and nobody's paying attention to it. I'm, I'm really grateful that, you know, our Fair Housing Center is 40 years old, which is so phenomenal. That's not common in the fair housing movement. There's, there's a, a dozen maybe that are older um, that have sustained, but we lost a lot of fair housing centers in the last 10, 15 years. There are communities that don't have any um, and we're really, um, open to providing resources regardless of where you live. We all work together to make sure Michigan is covered as a state to have fair housing in, in any way. I, essentially we're um, Holland North, uh, Lansing North, all the way up through the UP. Uh, we are 
federally funded. Uh, we have a mix uh, federally funded. We have some local grants um, from community development block grant dollars, CDBG, if you know the lingo. Uh, City of Holland is a CDBG community. They contract with us to help them do their fair housing, uh, which we are so fortunate to be included in that pot of money to do education and uh, take complaints and investigate complaints. We fundraise, you know, of course, we're a nonprofit. We don't have enforcement authority, but we can work with, you know, the Department of Justice takes our sexual harassment cases because they have authority. Boy, do they have authority. You know, Michigan Department of Civil Rights can order a landlord out of the business if they are discriminating to the point where, you know, they, they can't do it successfully uh, anymore. So we have all these partners um, that help us with enforcement, but we're, we're a nonprofit. So that's why I'm hoping you'll volunteer and, and um, check us out online and see if there's ways that work for you to engage. I'd love to speak to other groups if that's a possibility. We're doing another event with the museum that I'm so excited about in two weeks from tonight for families with children. Um, so please spread the word for that a bilingual yeah. event. We have a couple of questions that I want okay. us to get to before um, in the last few minutes. So the first one is single family, family zoning is sometimes seen as modern veiled redlining. Do you agree with this view? So that's an, uh, a really great um, question about access. So, you know, we have to think about from a fair housing perspective, we want an opportunity that meets the needs of each individual or family as they define it to be available. So if there's a market for single family zoning um, and people are able to access that without discrimination, that's great. But we wanna see housing cradle to grave. You know, so what works for us at the end of our life as we're launching you know, out of high school, college, what works for us at that point as, um, as our families maybe are launched out into the world and we downsize, what's available for us? What's affordable, what's quality? Um, what can we um, find? You know, that's the biggest issue. So I certainly understand the perspective that having one option leaves people out by its very nature, right? Or having an emphasis on only this. If we understand that there's a population that's historically and economically left out of that opportunity, that's a limit that we don't want to see. I think a healthy community has all sorts of housing opportunities um, at all sorts of affordability levels, and also in a way that's maintained as quality housing. That's a real challenge. Safe, uh, maintained housing. So there's another question that I'd love for you to get to uh, in the next few minutes, but for fair housing for those with disabilities, has it been broken down into physical or intellectual disabilities? So those would both be covered. The definition of disability under fair housing laws is a physical or mental disability that impairs or limits a major life activity. So we walk, bathe, breathe, drive, eat, hear, see, go to work, conduct our social lives in a different way because of a health condition. Huge definition, very broadly defined. Uh, this comes from the 1988 Fair Housing Act amendments um, that was beautifully crafted to be inclusive to allow people that might have a health condition that let's say two of us have, maybe I can live with it every day and I have a job and I'm functioning fairly well with my limits, but maybe somebody else, just because they're a different person, isn't able to function at uh, the same capacity. So it can be the same condition, the same label, the same disability, but very different day-to-day -day experiences. So it was really well crafted to allow for how the health condition impacts a unique individual. Um, and we certainly do have all kinds of um, disabilities represented within our caseload, both physical and mental disabilities. So hopefully I'm answering that question for that person. And I see Louise has her hand up. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I, I live in, it's, I'm Bob. I live in Douglas and I used to be on the plan commission. So I'm just going to make a comment about that single family zoning. We have an ordinance that does allow for smaller units uh, as small as 900 square feet which for most people who live in a single family home seems very small. And when a proposal came in for a lot of those units, 
my position was that's wonderful. We want it to be affordable. And the developer said, oh, they'll be affordable to the first owner. But we can't guarantee that the, the first owner will keep it affordable. And it's a community where many people just buy those as investments and just do Airbnb. So you, it's a system that allows for smaller residential units. That sounds wonderful. And in no time, they won't be affordable. They'll be gone. In, in practice, that intent goes away, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and that's exactly one of the complexities of um, the obligation that communities have. And, and zoning and planning commissions work very, very hard to talk about all of these difficult details and these difficult decisions. And then they have to try to engage with the community and help them understand these, these, you know, these technical ideas and then thinking out decades ahead. That's really phenomenal. It's not easy to do. These are citizen volunteers. Mm -hmm. So um, with very few um, city or township staff to support. So it's a great opportunity to be a stakeholder that's thinking about how can we provide housing for all in a sustainable way that will make Saugatuck or whatever Douglas or Grand Rapids or Holland, Charter Township, wherever we are, a great place to be for years to come for everyone. Because that's a success story for a community where everyone is welcome and able mm -hmm. to sustain their time and their lives there in a, in a really healthy way. That's such a great observation. Thank you for sharing. I think we're we're run our course. Um, this has been a fascinating, uh, very informative conversation. Thank you both, Fred and Liz, for your time and your expertise. All of these um, resources, even the ones that just came into the chat, we will share when we send out the uh, evaluation. You will get links to all of these. I'm also going to put one more uh, in there. Oops, she got muted. Can I do that? Okay, sorry <laughs> about that. Um, but I will put the link to our past programs. This program will be there as of early next week at the latest, um, and we are closed captioning it. So if um, anybody wants to watch the program again, if you missed anything on an audible level or somebody you know might need that extra um, little help, that will be there as well. Um, thank you so much for everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, please join us on the 18th, even if you don't have small kids, I think you will enjoy this bilingual program um, of, of fair housing for families. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a great Ricky, evening. Ricky, thank you so much for doing it. You and the museum staff and Liz, thank you also for your contribution. Thank, thank you, you so much, Dr. Johnson. Can we go on the road together? <laughs> when we are allowed to be out in public, let's go on the road. That means I'm <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all.